one, and uh, Coach will let the room start to populate here for just a couple seconds. Okay. So I want to welcome everybody to uh, this uh, our evening session here of day two for our Pro Coaches Basketball Summit. Uh, Lason Perkins here, and um, uh, all this is uh, kind of a collaboration between Basketball Immersion and Chris Oliver and uh, Virtual Coaches Clinic. And uh, we also want to thank Dr. Dish uh, for their uh, for their sponsorship of uh, of these uh, sessions. And so tonight, very excited to uh, have Mike Miller joining us. Uh, Coach Miller has worked at the college level. Um, we're both products of the Southland Conference, uh, having both coached in the, in the Southland Conference in the past. And, um, and of course, um, Coach has worked uh, with the uh, Knicks organization, both with the G League team as well as with the Knicks. So uh, really looking forward to, uh, to having him talk to us tonight about offensive concepts and spacing. It's, uh, it's, all, it's always one of those challenges, no matter what level we work with players teaching spacing, teaching offensive concepts. So uh, coach, thank you so much for joining us and uh, really looking forward to, to hearing what you have for us. Well, great. Well, I'm excited to be here. Thanks thanks for allowing me to uh, talk to the coaches and, and um, you know, talk a little bit about some offense and hopefully get some conversation, some dialogue going. So, um, you know, as, as coach Perkins mentioned, uh, I, I have spent some time, I've coached at different levels, and I feel like it's, it has really uh, been beneficial for me to be able to learn and to see the different things and experience a lot of different things. But, you know, as, as the longer that I have coached and the longer that I have done this, the more questions that I have, the more, you know, things that come up and you really dig into it, and you really want to know. So, um, you know, this is fun. You know, a lot of times, as a, even as a presenter, we pick up some things, you know, that, that people ask the questions, make you think a little bit deeper. So, you know, my purpose tonight is, is really, you know, just to, to talk a little bit about the offensive uh, concepts and, and how I have used these concepts to really teach our offense over the years and then how that's evolved and changed a little bit and just share some ideas with you. So the biggest thing you know, that I would like to do. I would like, like to make this interactive. I want you to feel free at any point. If you have a question, what we're talking about, um, something is not clear that, that I've mentioned, by all means, let's, uh, you know, let's get right into the question. We don't have to wait. I would rather have it open dialogue where, where I feel like as we leave this meeting tonight, everyone's had a chance, you know, to get something out of it and, um, you know, and, and it's made them think. So, um, you know, during this pandemic, probably as a lot of you have, I, I have been in my home uh, a lot and have really taken advantage of these Zoom calls and had a chance to listen to people with their philosophies and systems of play and what they're doing and, and have really spent a lot of time trying to grow in other areas. And I think over the course of time, you know, when I started coaching, I, I've been coaching now, I'm going, I'm going on 30 years. And when I started coaching, I didn't have anybody sit me down and say, you know what, the one thing you need to be prepared for are things are gonna constantly change. But as we've gotten into the technology and we have analytics and we have all of this video footage, we have all these things that we can do, it has changed year by year. And it, it has constantly been something that we have to keep up with. And, you know, not to mention, you know, in the off season, one of the things I really like to do is study leaders and other coaches, whether it be NFL coaches or, you know, last summer I was, I was studying Joe Madden, you know, who's with the Cubs. He's moved to the angels, a baseball manager and some of the things that he's done that have been, you know, somewhat innovative. And I, you know, thought there were things that crossed over from, from even baseball, you know, into pro basketball. So, you know, with that said, you know, ready, ready to kind of get started and, and talking about some offense a little bit. You know, the biggest thing I think when we're getting ready, you know, to talk about what we're going to do, there's a difference between an offensive philosophy and an offensive system, because that philosophy that you have may, you know, uh, may be altered as, as you go along. You know, your system could be different, but that philosophy you know, is, is going to stand and, and uh, 
be really the basis of what you're trying to do and what your purpose is. And I think the biggest thing when we talk about uh, offense is, are we being effective and are we being efficient? Not only in how we are playing, but how we're teaching it and are we getting better? We have to have a way that this continues to grow and it continues to get better. So, you know, as we talk about this and I, you know, I know we've got high school coaches and I know that we've got college coaches and maybe some pro coaches out there and we all have the same things that, that we're looking at. So, you know, I think when you start looking at your offensive system and really evaluate it so we can get into these concepts that I want to talk about, I think, that, you know, the first thing we have to look at, take a look at what are the current trends, what's going on in basketball right now. And even when I was a college coach and was looking you know, and seeing what was happening, you know, the NBA is out in front of that. And we're so lucky now that we have access to Euro league games and other things that we can watch and learn and put some wrinkles into. Um, and again, just because, you know, we have a, a philosophy offensively, we're going to work off of that doesn't make, mean that we're not making tweaks to our system where it makes it better based on personnel or other things. One thing I wanted to kind of bring up tonight, these are these are five things that that you know over the course of time you know uh, have worked in the in the NBA G League for six years prior to being in the NBA. You know during that time had a chance to coach uh, with with Team USA. You know in the FIBA qualifiers with Coach Jeff Van Gundy. So you know we're seeing you know different different systems and styles of play. But five things I thought maybe we would mention tonight as we start talking about this one so much five out alignment with no low post and how that impacts different things because that that obviously has transitioned and changed so you know how how you are able to be effective and efficient in a five out system if that fits you possibly you know a lot of a lot of teams are going where you know they have shooting bigs it creates matchup problems and so forth so you know that's one thing the second thing, playing against switches. Um, we, this year in the NBA, we played against a lot of switches. You know, uh, a team that comes to mind right away that's really good at it is Houston and, and how effective they were. And I think, you know, we have maybe a conception sometimes that people that are switching a lot, they're not real physical or, or they're soft switches. We played, we played Houston this year and anytime we tried to drop into the post off of those those uh, switches, Eric Gordon, James Harden, whoever it was, those guys were as physical as anybody. Getting into the legs of the post guys and driving them out, they're hitting cutters, they're they're super aggressive, very effective with the switches. So as an offensive system, how are we going to attack those switches? Third thing. The offense right now, particularly we saw in the NBA, the players have gotten so good at drawing fouls. It's created a whole different dimension. It's creating for defenses now that have to really take a look at how they're closing out and what they're doing. Because, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, in what era you played or you've coached or whatever. It's always been a rule. Don't foul a jump shooter. And it's happening at a higher rate. Than, than I can remember, but the offensive players have gotten so good using their body and angles and creating fouls that, you know, it has to be something that we look at putting into our offensive systems and using it. The fourth thing is, as we saw during the NBA playoffs this year, maybe more prevalent as high school and college, the zone, you know, playing against more zone. I think the success that we saw Miami have playing their zone moving through uh, the playoffs, getting into the finals, they were very effective with it. So it makes one more thing now that all of us have to be better at, you know, as we prepare our offensive attacks. Last thing in this current trend that I wanted to mention is in the NBA, we've played the majority of what we play against in pick and roll now are deep drops. Deep, I mean, you know, as we determine what it is, you're up to touch or, or maybe you're going to, you know, you're going to impact that ball handler coming off or is it a center field? We're seeing the deep drops with these guys back in the paint. And obviously that changes how we need to attack and the different things that we can do. So those were some things that, that I wanted to mention that I've seen at the NBA level that are really trending 
and are really a big part of the plan. Let's think about offensively. What, what is it we're trying to do? We're trying to create an advantage, right? We want to create an advantage. We want to keep the advantage and we want to use the advantage through a possession. So as we go through it, what is it that's going to create, you know, uh, an advantage for us? So a big part of this now, as we get into it, is what's your personnel look like? And what are you going to be able to do? Again, philosophically, we're looking at this and we know what, what our purpose is, what we're trying to do. System-wise, it ties into what our philosophy is, but your system obviously is going to be dictated what's your skill level, what's your personnel, uh, how can you use your players to, to maximize what they do? How are you getting your best shots, your, your shots for your guys that shoot the ball the best? How are you creating driving situations from long closeouts to create that? You know, how are you getting to the paint? How are you getting to the foul line? As we do that, I did want to share a couple of things with you. Um, I, we were doing this uh, about a week ago, got into this information, and, and it really, you know, made me really stop and think about this and, and try to figure out our system of play. And this is what I want to share with you. Offensively in the NBA this year, on shots that were taken, from the 24 second shot clock to 18. So from 24 to 18, teams averaged 1.26 points per possession and shot 53%. Obviously we're talking about advantage breaks, um, early offense type stuff, early in the clock with attack. But that is the highest number on the board. 24 to 18, it's 1 1.6, 1.26 points per possession 52.9% field goal percentage, okay? From 18 to 12 seconds on a shot clock, shot taken, 1.15 points per possession at 46.8 field goal percentage, okay? 12.6, I'm sorry, from 12 to six seconds, it's 1.10 at 45% field goal percentage. So you can see where we're at with our numbers. And then when we get to the final six seconds of the shot clock, it's 0.95 points per possession at 37.9% field goal percentage. So as we're building our offense, how, how do we put ourselves in a position where we're getting good shots early in the shot clock? You know, I've heard Coach Van Gundy say, you know, on television many times in these two for one situations, don't get two bad shots out of it. We've got to make sure we're getting good shots. How many good shots can we get? Okay. So the next step, as we look at that, because again, this is everything is analytics driven now. How are you preparing? How are you playing with the most purpose? Point distribution, free throws, 1.5. Four points per possession per two free throws. Again, free throws, 1.54 points per possession. Layups, 1.33 points per possession. Three point field goals, 1.07 points per possession. Okay. Those are the three most efficient, highest point per possession ways to score. Some of you, you know, you may, you may already know that. Point being, what are we doing to create our offense where we're putting ourselves in those situations where we're conscious of that? I know we get to the end of the game, we're going to look at the score sheet and see what we did. But, you know, what are we doing that gets us fouled? Our guys that can really drive it, guys that make free throws, how do we get fouled? How are we getting to the rim? You know, it's not, I, not put your head down, drive it in. What are we doing? Third thing, obviously, with the three-point shots, how are we getting open threes in rhythm, okay? With that said, what, what I'd like to do is, is just, you know, give you a couple of examples of offensive philosophy material. And, and these are some things that, that I think are important and, and you know, I've included, and, and I would say this is my philosophy. You know, we had a conversation with some coaches about a month ago, and, and they said, you know what, every coach should have his overall philosophy of, of what the team is going to be about and an offensive and a defensive philosophy all the time. And again, as you learn, as you evolve, it may, you might tweak that a little bit, but there are things that you believe in 
and, and things, you know, that you're going to try to really get better at and work on. So a few ideas here, you know, offensive philosophy. I've got seven things that I'm going to touch. Number one is the point distribution emphasis. Just what we talked about. We want to get to the free throw line. We want to get layups and points in the paint. And we want open spot up threes. Preferably, we really like those corner threes. That's, that's the first thing that we want to make sure our offense is giving us those opportunities. Second thing, we want space, we want pace, and we want movement with our offense. So with that said, we talk about spacing. That's going to be a big piece of what we're talking about tonight. Spacing is, is just to me is, is just like an assist, more important than an assist because the pass won't happen unless you have great spacing. Space, spacing is an unselfish act. Um, spacing starts in transition and it goes all the way through the possession and it's always changing. You know, what is spacing? If I'm playing off the ball, and, and a lot of you coaches probably remember Tex Winter, and, and Tex Winter was a, a phenomenal, maybe one of the greatest offensive minds that we've seen in basketball, and he's left his mark, certainly. But one of the things he used to talk about, he had his principles of offense, and he would say, if all things are equal and there's five guys out there, that means you're going to play without the ball 80% of the time. You start thinking about that, how you're spaced. You know, part of spacing is if you're in the right space and correctly spaced, the ball should be able to see you. You know, one of the old things that we started when we started teaching a long time ago was spacing should be 15 to 18 feet minimum. And if you're going to, to be off, let's make it a little bit farther really to open that floor up and create more room for people to play and for more actions. But Spacing is continuous, and it's, it's one of the most important concepts, you know, that, that we have and something we're going to come back to and, and talk some more about that. Second thing out of, out of space, pace, and movement is we want to play with a lot of pace. You know, I just talked about, you know, with if, if we know that from 24 seconds to 18 seconds on the shot clock, that is the highest point per point per possession thing we can do, we need to make sure that we're playing with some pace, we're getting that ball down the floor, we're creating opportunities for that to happen. Certainly it could be off your defense, it can be off your stop and score stuff. Um, and, and just as we watch the Lakers do during the NBA playoffs, how fast they are converting from their defense to offense, getting down the floor, finding good shots and finishing good shots. Our transition, our entries into whatever sets that we're running, our cuts, all of those things create a flow. And we want that flow to have great pace because if it has pace, then it's gonna have force. You know, one thing we put on our whiteboard every game that we played this year with the Knicks is play with force. And then we, we would put examples of what playing with force means. And, and that's a big thing, you know, right behind that, is the ball movement with a purpose. We wanna play with a two count. That means when that ball comes to you, you have a thousand one, thousand two, it's gotta be shot, pass or drive. Something has to happen where that ball is not sticky. You know, there's nothing that frustrates players more or coaches as seeing that ball stick and stop. You know, we want purpose with that ball movement, play off a two count, get it moving. As I said earlier, we're trying to you know, create an advantage, keep an advantage and use the advantage. So if that ball sticks, we're losing that piece. And, and then obviously what we want out of this movement is we want uncontested shots in rhythm. Um, you know, when I, I was coaching for the Spurs in the, in the D league, that was one of the things that we really kept track of was uncontested shots. Who is getting the most uncontested shots? Obviously, you know, on the other end, we're trying to make sure we do a good job. But that was a huge point that we made is the team. That was one of the stats that we kept. The team that gets the most uncontested shots, it's a big advantage, okay? The third piece that I wanna talk about is the fundamental aspect. We are all player development coaches. I, I, 
you know, I haven't coached in college for, for going on nine years now. So I've been out of the college game for a while, but I would assume that, that things are trending at the college level the same way and at the high school level the same way that coaches now are, are specialists like everything else. This guy is a shooting coach. This guy's an offensive coach. This guy works with the big man. One thing that, that's for, for certain and I, that I know this is we are all player development coaches. We are all making players better. And how we are able to teach the fundamentals is the key to any offensive system or anything offensively you're gonna to do. To me, it's the, it's the key concept in this thing because we have to have the fundamentals. With that said, really believe in a specificity when we're, when we're teaching and um, the drill work the shooting drills, everything we do, it's for a reason and it fits. So any, any shots, you know, we break down the point guards are gonna get shots that the point guards get out of our offense. You know, the wings, they're gonna get shots they get out of our offense. That's where we're gonna spend all of our time, you know, right down the line. Um, the shooting, you know, what, what I talked about earlier, if we know that free throws and layups are at the top of the spectrum in terms of how we are able to efficiently score points, then we have to be able to finish plays. You know, uh, we all want to be able to protect our paint, try to keep that ball out where we're not getting in foul trouble or we're giving up shots at the basket, uh, which are creating second shots possibly. So, you know, how are we getting to the rim? But the big, big piece of this is we need to be able to finish. Um, this year, no matter what our breakdown work, you know, work was going to be with the Knicks, if, if we were going to go out and do a, a, you know, an individual workout with a guy, he's going to start and finish. He's going to finish through contact. He's going he's to finish with footwork. He's, you know, we would talk about the skill finishes and depending by position, what kind of shots they get. But that shooting has to start at the rim. If we're going to emphasize that, and, and we know the numbers tell us that those are the shots, we have to start with that. Then we've got to be able to finish and we have to work on it every day, finishing through contact, right, left, you know, off, you know, which foot, you know, whether it be, you know, what we call outside, outside for a right-handed layup. I'm going off my right foot with my right hand to protect the ball, whatever that is, whatever we have to do, we need to be prepared to make those shots. Footwork is the foundation of the game. And we need to make sure as we're teaching the game that that's a big part of it, that players understand that. The game will get easier as players' footwork gets better. And we're gonna be able to do more things as that happens. I really believe that. Um, and then, you know, we've talked about the shooting, the footwork and so forth, the passing principles, you know, being able to pass and catch. We talked about this for, a lot when I was a college coach and we, we talked about, you know, the concepts of, well, you know, not everybody maybe is going to be a great shooter. We have different roles that we, that we have on our team. But the one thing that we found, it's more difficult to hide a poor passer than it is a poor shooter because, you know, the passing comes into play. And so pass catch execution is and the specificity with it, the types of passes that we want to throw is, is big, all right? The fourth thing, philosophically then, we want to touch the paint. You know, we actually counted this year with our point guards in transition, their percentages touching the paint. You know, we really wanted them playing with a downhill force and be able to touch that paint with the ball. Now, as we talk about that, we want to penetrate the defense. So it starts with that downhill and transition with our point guards of, of playing with that force, with that pace. But it's also about cuts. You know, cutting is such a, a big part of our offenses, particularly as we're spreading things out, playing more five out, more four out. We need to cut effectively and efficiently through the defense. And, and that's a huge thing, cutting with pace and with force and touching the paint with those cuts. Um, our roles, you know, hard roles, when, when we get with our bigs coming out of those ball screens with their action and getting downhill. Um, we wanna create kick out threes. You know, again, we talked about these numbers that, that I covered with you. 
we want those kick out threes, getting downhill and that ball movement early and creating those situations. We need transition points. How do we get transition points? You know, advancing the ball. Again, I'll bring up the Lakers. This year, it, it was, they were so fast. They were so aggressive. They were so good defensively swarming. And then how fast they were able to get that thing out. And, you know, they're not bouncing that ball a lot in the backcourt. And, and I think, you know, that's a, another concept that we're talking about. We want to advance the ball from the backcourt and not dribble it out of the backcourt. It's so much harder to defend, so much harder to prepare for. Um, you know, whether, whether we're playing against trap, zone, doesn't matter. We still have to touch the paint and play with that downhill force, okay? We make a second side emphasis with, with uh, the offense. And with that, we wanna catch the ball on the move. We don't wanna catch it stationary, you know? We want to get out and go. So if we're talking about offensively, we're going to play without the ball 80% of the time if all things are equal. We know they're not. The point guard's going to touch it more. And, but, but in theory, 80% of the time, okay? So we talked about the spacing. If I'm spaced properly, the ball should be able to see me. There should be a clear path where the ball can get to me if I'm spaced properly. The second thing is, is this was a, a coach winner principle that he used is you need to split your vision. So I need to know as I get set up as a college coach, we emphasize this over and over till the guys were sick of it, but have the knees bent, have the hands up and split your vision, split your vision to know where the ball is so that it, again, the ball can see me. Second thing is how am I guarded? Where is my man at? Part of that principle is the defense names the play. If you are looking and you're paying attention and you split your vision off the ball, the defense will name the play. They will tell you what you should do and, and we wanna take advantage of, it, okay? Moving, moving forward, you know, some of the concepts in this philosophy that, that we really want to do a good job teaching. Driving kick game, okay? We're gonna talk about this a little bit more, but doesn't matter what your system is. You know, you're gonna come out and with your system of play, you're gonna have your transition attack. Then you're gonna have when the defense is set and, and we're in a stop and score situation, secondary offense, maybe some people call, uh, we're gonna have our set plays and our offense that we wanna play out of. And then what happens after all of those things? When we've talked about the numbers and how the percentages go against you as you get deeper into the clock where that defense is really set and is in a position where it makes it tough. So um, the driving kick game is big, you know, being able, again, playing off a two count catch, drive kick, catch the ball on the move. That was one of the things working in the Spurs system and Manu Ginobili was playing for the Spurs at that time and having a chance to watch him, you know, over extended periods of time and how good he was off the ball, never caught the ball standing still. He was always on the move and getting downhill and, and he was so difficult to guard. Uh, another concept that, that we teach every day is three man spacing or pick and roll spacing. Example being, we're, we're going old school. I've got, uh, I've got the board here, but in three man spacing, let's say our pick and roll situation is this, you guys see this? So our screener is here, we're here. Three-man spacing that I'm talking about is over here. So here's our action. If, if um, you guys can see that, somebody let me know if you can't. But I can, Coach, we can see it. Okay, but here's our action. So when I talk about three-man spacing, this is what I'm talking about. So again, this gets us maybe out of our primary action, but it could be, you know, honestly, you know, we find ourselves in these three man spacing situations a lot when he's coming down the floor and we get to this sideline drag um, in that situation. So we're in our three man spacing, but you know, in the NBA on a missed shot, there's a very high percentage of time that we are coming down the floor and a, a drag or a sideline drag or 77 double drag is going to be, you know, one of the things that we go to, one of the things that we do. So, you know, you find this three-man spacing a lot. And, 
you know, what happens? Okay, if it's, if it's a college game, when I was a college coach, I would tell those defenders, I want you to paint that midline. I don't want, I want you stacked in there. So now, you know, we start looking at what we can do off of these actions. And this is one of the concepts that I wanted to talk to you about tonight. And, you know, while we're on it, we'll just, we'll just kind of go through the different things that we can do when we get in this three-man spacing. Now, I'm not sure what you're playing against the most, but as we're coming down the floor, again, very important. We want this point guard coming from the back court with, with force, playing with pace, making this defender guard him as he's coming down the floor. So he's not worried about that screen. He has to actually stop the ball physically. We're lined up over here. Doesn't really matter position-wise right now. I know a lot of teams are playing with, you know, this type of alignment where, you know, there's no post. Um, it may be the, it's a shooting big out here, uh, whatever the situation might be. But let's say we, you know, uh, as we had that, sorry, he's coming in from the backcourt. So we beat, our big got the rebound and we have beat him down the floor is what we're looking at. So now as that ball is, is coming, we like to break the free throw line. If it's there, if not, we can change the angles. And the best thing about it with these screens, you know, he can, he can set, you know, at any angle he needs to, to create an advantage to get downhill for this guy. All right. Well, let's say now that in, in the NBA, the majority of the time, this play is going to be an ice or a down, which means, you know, the, the big, he's going to drop. I talked to you earlier about these deep drops. That's the X5 down here. And then that means defensive coverage now. Our point guard is going to jump in here and actually get above and force that ball down. So the call frequently is either, you know, is, is ice or down. With this alignment, so now the ball is moving this direction. So this is one of our concepts. Ball is, ball is being dribbled on the baseline, three-man spacing. What are, we, what are we looking for, okay? So what's happened on that? probably is this defender is probably going to be somewhere in this area. This guy's responsible, even though they're in a deep drop, he's going to be in just in case he needs him to rotate, depending on what the coverages are. Could be, could be different. And the one thing I want to say, you know, that I, I should have said in the beginning, there's a lot of different ways to do things. And just because I'm showing you something doesn't mean it's the best way. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of ways to look at it and a lot of system of play. But with this, we always, again, we want the ball to be able to see us. So we want to hold this corner spot. That's a big spot as we're playing against this. And we want to be able to utilize it. So we want that corner filled and we want that action. Okay. So as he's coming off of it, let's say the big is a roller. And as he's starting to roll, we're looking here. Can we get some type of cutting action, you know, coming off of this from here? The other thing that, you know, if he's a roller, we can pull this guy back behind it, okay? That's, that's one scenario that we can play through. I wanna show you a couple others while we're talking about it. You know, one thing you, you've probably seen Boston play really good at it in, in the same type of situation as we have our three-man spacing or pick and roll spacing as we're coming over to set it and we're driving it and he's our roller of this cutter coming down and trying to pin in the help. Houston does it, really difficult to defend. Um, in, the, in the G League, Toronto's team coached by uh, Jerry Stackhouse did this and hit several threes. It was a tough, you know, we're down there thinking we're in coverage and, and we're getting screened in. That's, that's a nice action to add to it. Um, you know, and then, you know, obviously another action, if you, if you like, um, you know, you could cut the corner guy. Anytime you don't have a corner and that ball is dribbled down, we certainly want to fill that spot to make sure that we fill. So, you know, there's a lot of different things you can do, just giving you a few ideas of, of stuff to look at. But, you know, one of our areas this year that we looked at, we talked about constantly and used on the film was what we were doing out of three-man spacing and, and what those situations would be. Uh, we really like throw and goes, you know, throw and goes. 
because if we're playing against deep drops, they're in pick and roll coverage and we throw the ball and chase it. So throw and goes, something we work on every day in practice. Again, let's say it's a, it's a drag scenario coming down and the five is trailing it and he's coming over and they've already called ice and he's dropped into it. He's, his job is to push it down. This defender is already all the way down and we're in three man spacing over here. As he comes off of it, he comes down, he's got him in coverage to throw it back to this guy and then come and get it, which allows him now to get back over the top of this in this deep drop and to create something with this other side. You know, at point, we're probably looking at some type of, you know, slot cut here, depending on, on spacing. It might be, you know, a slot cut from here. It, it's, again, it's going to depend on, you know, how you're being defended, where these people are at. And, and again, seeing the defense, the defense names of play, but really like those throw and goes. We're seeing a lot of these deep drops. How do we attack it? How do we take advantage of it? Throw and go, you know, has been, has been a good thing. Um, what are you doing when you're throwing the ball to the post? So that's a concept that we work on, you know, every, every other day. We had a team that had post up guys. You know, you look around if, you know, your high school team, your college team, your, you know, the Lakers had post up guys, the, you know, you go through it and you play off those post players. So as we're playing off those posts, we want to be able to, you know, have our routes down and know what we're trying to do with it. So we need to go through those routes. And when I was talking about shooting specificity, these are the types of things that we create our shooting drills with these concepts so we know what it is we're trying to do. So, you know, with our post-ups, you know, what are we going to do? Um, you know, not a lot of overloads. Obviously, there's not enough room when we're filling the corners. So we get into a lot of this potentially with our alignment with the ball right here. So when the ball goes in, what are we doing? You know, um, if this is the big and we talk about spacing, then, you know, we're going to make this cut. We want to make a hard cut to get it back. You know, as he's clearing, then we're going to dive this guy down as well. You know, and then as we're filling, again, you know, we used to call this with the Spurs, the longitudinal line, that we don't want to cross that line unless we have to, to be an outlet, again, where the ball can see you, but give that post player a chance to play and make the defender if I'm here, he has the ball here now and we've created space on this side. If this defender has to commit, now obviously we, we have actions that we want to play out of, okay? So, you know, what are our post routes going to be? You know, a couple other things, uh, you know, Golden State is so effective running what, what I would call like a split cut. So, you know, the action being here, here, post player, you know, as we talked about, ball goes in and we're coming and screening. You're playing against a switching team. Great opportunity to, to uh, slip out of that cut and get to the basket. You know, then we can fill. We can do it at the other angle. You know, if this is a big and this is a shooter, you know, let's say that's the two and he's past it, that we set that flare coming back off of it. It's a tough angle coming off of it. So there's a lot of different things, you know, that we can do with it. One thing um, I saw Orlando do, which is what a lot of people in the NBA also are doing with out of bounds plays. Let's say, you know, whoever, you know, personnel, again, it can be interchangeable, but we make that pass to the post and we get into this, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna come across, you know, to set these screens and and play off of that game you know you play these little cutting games where you know he might slip through that one and then you know he may come off of it and come back but they're playing that that little cutting game off the top based on you know the spacing and angles to the basket um but i have seen teams have ran you know those actions off of it as well uh concepts playing off the of switches we we have to practice playing against switches every day to be prepared for it 
baseline drives. You know, I talked about a little bit of, of what we are going to do on baseline drives. You know, I, I talked early, the terminology, we want to make sure on baseline drives, even if this guy's up here and he's driving the ball down, we have to drift on baseline drive. We have to baseline drift to be there for that pass. Okay. Um, if we, if we have a, a low post at this time, let's say, you know, there's a guy here and he's in the, what we would call the dunker spot. If you make sure you can see it and that ball's driving baseline. His job is to get to the dots to either free it up for that pass or that pass. And that again, you know, we're talking about specifics. Again, that is one of our shooting drills that we work on. Um, you know, the other thing that, that I really like is depending on where this guy is spaced, let's say we're here already and we get to our, whatever the situation, maybe it's pick and roll, ends up being a baseline drive. He's rolling. This pull behind is really difficult because everybody's sinking. If we start looking at what the coverages are with this, you know, the low man, this guy has to come across and take roll. And again, if they're in a deep drop, maybe he doesn't have to help as much. Because, and that's the, the purpose, obviously, of the deep drops. But as we play through it now, and we know the rotations, there's nobody covering this guy coming back behind the ball. He gets lost a lot. You've got a shooter up top that's really a great place on these actions going baseline, is coming back behind the ball. Again, with one of the first things we talked about when I started was, the ball being able to see you if you're spaced and you have to be a receiver. Um, you know, screening obviously, and then middle drives and where our cuts go. Um, you know, and that's, those are the concepts. And I'm gonna touch on a few more as we go into it, but just wanted to do it. Your concepts may be completely different and how you wanna play, where you think your team is and, and what you need to do. When we went to our sets this year, um, you know, it was a little bit different. I was at start of the year as an assistant coach. And then, you know, 20 games into it, I was, I was coaching the team. And so during that time, you know, we didn't have a lot of time to practice. You know, we had a West Coast trip coming up that we were, you know, we went through, I think it was, uh, you know, Portland and uh, Golden State and Denver. And I mean, we're, we're hitting the West Coast and, and every game obviously is, is, very difficult to prepare for and to play in. One of the things that we went to, we said, we want to try to simplify as we go into it because we felt like our guys are gonna be a lot more comfortable in simplicity and allow them you know, to, to kind of find a groove and, and to play in the situation that we were in. So we went to it and we said, okay, we're gonna have a core four set of plays. And those were the plays on game days that we scripted the most, that we knew. Because on a made basket, the point guard knew we're in one of these four sets. Now there's multiple actions to the set, but he would call one of those four core plays, which I think helped our pace. I think it helped us play with more force. And I think it gave, you know, just the simplicity of it it helped the guys. They knew this is what we were going to be in. And then as it turned out, probably with most teams that, you know, our starting guard had a preference to maybe two or three of the plays. Our, our guy that ran the second unit, he may have, have used one of the plays that the first, you know, first guard didn't use. So we were hitting all of our sets, but we felt like they, they fit our players. And, you know, again, anything that we had, it had to be, you know, very specific why we were doing it, what we were expecting to get out of it. And then we paid attention to see, are we getting what we think we should be getting through the analytics, through, you know, after each game, watching the films and seeing the numbers and seeing what we were trying to get. Um, we, I thought it was really important too, is, is to have a terminology. And everything had a name, not only the sets, but as I was talking to you earlier about, some of them are universal terms that everybody uses. You know, if it's gonna be a double drag, it's 77. If it's, if it's um, 
uh, you know, coming down the floor, if it's a drag, you know, he can, he can hit his hip to let the guy know and, and give him a visual that he's coming in and he's going to offer him a drag. But everything had a name. And in the terminology, we did the terminology on booklets to make sure that it was really easy for guys that like to look at things that way. And then we also made a video playbook that would have the terminology and that would also have all of the sets where they could actually watch the plays and they could study it that way. Before the games, you know, we spent more time with our stuff. We would put those core four on the board to make sure everybody was comfortable. We could visualize then we knew whoever we were playing, um, how they were going to play us. You know, you play Orlando, Orlando is a great defensive team. They're going to keep you on a side. You're going to have to be real specific how you attack their defense out of what you do and with your concepts. Last thing, the seventh thing in the, in the philosophy is really see the importance being efficient and effective. Again, same word with our ATOs, with our base out of bounds and with our side out of bounds. Not to mention, again, I, I didn't mention end of game stuff. Obviously that's, that's a category of its own, but the players are gonna recognize the confidence coming from those players. You know, I, I've coached a long time and I've talked about this and I, I, I believe this is we can't just make players confident. Now we can do things to help and we need to, that's part of our job and how we help them play, you know, at their best level. But when you're creating good shots with these situations, you know, your best shooter is getting good looks coming out of these ATOs, base OB, side OB, anything that you have a chance to, to put out there, that's big. You know, those players know, and they're going to trust in you to find that. It's a great way, you know, to not only, you know, find ways to create points, but also to, um, you know, be in a situation where those guys are confident with that. And winning the specialty areas, you know, how many opportunities do you get to do those things? Because this game is moving. And we're teaching the game as it's moving. So when we have an opportunity to win an area, that, that's an area to really lock into. So those, those are some of the philosophy, a little bit of the spacing. Do we want to take a second maybe and uh, have a couple questions here? Yeah, Coach. Uh, we've got some uh, – we do have some questions here. Um, so one of the first questions, I, I think maybe you talked about this a little bit, but what are some examples of playing with force? Playing with force, it starts, it starts really coming out of the backcourt. You know, you're playing with force. So let's, let's use an example. If you're – and again, we'll use terms. Can you guys see the board okay? Is that okay? Yes. So if, if I'm one of these wing or a lane runner, if you give it a label – I'm sprinting with force to get there because I'm getting there. That might be a shot, but I have to open the floor up because potentially we may have a rim runner. We may not. The, the rim runner may rebound, but let's say that we do have one and he's blasting down that floor. He's attacking that rim with force where the ball can come over top. We're driving this thing with force down the floor. It's, there is force with it. If, you know, we are in a situation and we brought the ball up and let's say the five is trailing, he comes into it and screams, we are working with this guy blasting out of there with force. So it's cuts, it's rolls, it's drives. Now, we're going to emphasize drives. This is true at every level, particularly I've coached at the college level too. And, and we coached our defense at the college level to really protect that paint and be in there because you can. Obviously at the NBA level, you have to clear the lane. But what we really emphasize is this guy. And if the ball handler is here and, and this guy, his defender is here and I attack and I can freeze this guy just enough on that kick, our drives on the second side are extreme force because now that might create that drive pitch and creates that next wave. But that's what we're talking about with force. If we're running cuts, it's at full blast. So a big piece of it is, you know, we do five on zero. 
we did five on zero this year with our team with the Knicks just as much or more than I ever did it as a college coach. We do a lot of it. And, you know, I'm going to talk after we go through this about some of the buildup things that we do to get to this point. But that's, I hope that's a good definition of playing with force. Next question was, uh, you talked about three-man spacing. Now, do you have a particular preference that you like, or is it personnel-based, you know, a shooter versus a non-shooter? Well, it can be. It, it certainly can be. But I think a lot of it, it starts with how the defense plays. Because when we get to our three-man spacing, and I, and I tell you, this is, this is one of the things that, um, that I've done a lot of is after every game, I was clipping our spacing to look at it, you know, to try to see just what you've asked, what fits us the best, how are we utilizing it, what are we doing? We have to move this backside around. Obviously, we're trying to create an advantage and be able to play. We're trying to play in a rhythm. So it's constantly moving and adjusting with our space. So whatever the situation is, we ran a lot of pistol. Okay, so to answer your question, which guy would we want to cut? Well, when we ran the pistol, I'm sure, you know, everybody understands kind of what we're talking about with our pistol. Okay, so this is what it looks like. Let me back this guy up. So everybody see, I'm coming down the court. This is your normal pistol alignment. He's coming up. He's going to catch the ball, top of the key extended. We're going to make this pass. 15, 18 feet as soon as he opens up. Well, he's coming behind it, right? Everybody recognizes the action now. So he comes off of it. Let's say he gives it back to him. He hands it back. That's an option. If his defender goes two men removed and goes under, I can give it back to him. I give it back to him. Here comes the flare. So this guy is flaring up top. The reason I'm showing you this, we run a lot of pistol. A lot of the NBA teams excuse me, you saw the Lakers, you saw Miami, you see a lot of teams are running pistol action, okay? Well, when we just did what I drew up, this guy, the two that came off the flare, because as five set his flare, he's going to set a second screen. So he's going to space to get to three-man spacing. He may not be all the way set. So as he's driving, this guy is open a lot. He's open because this guy's coming across to help. His man is dropping. This guy is still going with the cutter. So it's kind of a coverage thing. Again, if we're playing a lot against a lot of deep drops, the teams, you know, they have the rim protectors. Uh, you know, we had Mitchell Robinson this year. We want him in a deep drop. He's a great shot blocker. Um, you know, the Nets had uh, DeAndre Jordan and uh, Jared Allen, and those guys were in super drops. Um, uh, you saw in the Denver, Denver would play deep drops as well. So the deep drops are made to try to take away some of that action that I'm talking about, but it still can get in, but there's any number of things that you can do, but it's important that it's part of your concepts. So the big thing is <clears throat> be in a position where the ball can see you and see the defense. I got to split your split my vision where I can see the ball and I see how I'm guarded. As soon as my man turns his head, obviously we all teach the same thing. I'm gonna cut behind his head if I can. But that cut, I think you're very familiar. If you've been watching NBA basketball, you've seen it. Well, let's look at one more type. Let's say we're college, okay? And you're playing against my college team and I've got my guys are in there. And we're coming off of this drive again, okay? and he's spacing and maybe maybe he didn't get all the way to spacing and he's more here. This has been the four and that's been the two. So now when he's driving and he has to go and he's dropping really like this action, as I showed you earlier that Houston does, instead of him making the slot cut, he comes in and sets that little in screen on the outside that Houston takes advantage of and they're throwing it, shooting that corner three. Again, it's part of our concepts. How many corner threes can we get on a paint touch and kick out? But that's just another way, you know, that, that you can get to that. And again, you're countering the coverage and how they're playing. You know, 
we get in situations, you know, with our spacing as we talk about it. If, if we get in situations where there's nowhere to cut, we've told our guys that, that we're in a hole. You can't cut if there is nowhere to cut, obviously. Let's say the timing, because things aren't always going to be perfect. Um, as he's coming over and, and we're going downhill and the timing's off, and I'm this guy out here, he's already in there. Obviously, I can't, I can't cut on top of it. So we have to recognize you know, what's in front of us and what we have. But it starts with how, how I'm being played and then absolutely personnel, what do I do? How do I get my shooters a good look? One more question I'd, I'd, I'd ask on that. So on the three-man side, if let's say you're running a, let's say it's maybe a one-four pick and roll and this is going to be a pick and pop. Would okay. you manipulate the three-man side in order to make sure that the per, the defender that X is out to the shooter is either a, a bigger player and or, or possibly a smaller player? What, how, how would you, what, okay. what is your strategy there? So if I understand it, we're, we're coming um, either way. It can come this way. He can drive it and pop, right, or go the other way. But Correct. basically, he's going to catch it in the slot area. Yes, it, it, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, we've got to take away the help, right? So it's it's this guy as we come off of this, and a lot of teams are doing that for that reason. When it's a pick and pop, it can be the four, it can be a shooting five. It's the same thing. But as we get into that now, and he's coming off of it and driving it, and he's popping, you know, on the flight, this guy's man is going to be, he's going to have to stunt, right? I mean, he's in a position where he's going to have to stay. As soon as this guy just even shows at him, he's cutting behind his head. You know, we're looking at that. And so, yeah, we definitely would cut whoever the helper is. So as we talk about it, we might as well, you know, take a look at this too. What about our situations when, maybe our floor is balanced, right? Because we're in that a lot too. Three-man spacing we see a lot of, but we see this a lot too. So we see this action with him coming off and we, we have the same options that we can play off of. So it might be, you know, a scenario, let's say, let's say this is a shooting big, okay? So as he comes off of it and, and he screens and he pops, well, he's got to stay down, right? That's what we're doing on the backside because if I'm coming across, I'm trying to clear the lane and give space and then I'm looking to throw back. But when I do that, he can't lift on that one because he's already there. Everybody sees that, okay? Well, now again, we know personnel. When we played this year with Mitchell Robinson and we came into these situations, which we get into a lot, okay? and he comes off of it, we know he's rolling, looking for the lob. And we know if he gets behind him, this guy has to help. So he's going to lift out of that corner. So when I'm coming off, I'm looking here, or I'm looking back based on what that low man did. His man is the guy that I'm going to keep. But again, the ball has to see him. He has to relocate. Spacing goes throughout the whole possession. It never stops. And you constantly are adjusting and moving whether it be as simple as that lift or if I'm here and somebody drives here, then I'm sliding. I have to get away from the ball. If I'm going this way, I've got to get away or I've got to pull to the ball are the, the spacing rules that we're talking about. Does that Perfect. make sense? Absolutely. So coach, we've got about 10 minutes. Okay. Do we have some more questions? Um, that's it at the, for the moment. Okay. Okay. Well, let's let's hit a couple a couple more things here. Um, well, let me ask this real quick. I was going to go over, um, you know, a couple of build up type things of getting into, you know, with the concepts and spacing and offense. Or is there something that someone had that they really wanted to to cover today? Real quickly, if there's anything specifically like coach to to talk about, uh, go ahead and type in the, in the question and answer box. I know personally, one question I would have is we're seeing a lot more up. You talked about post action earlier. We're seeing a lot more uphill uh, dribble handoffs out of the post. What, what are your thoughts there on that? And, and what are some, maybe some teaching points on that? Offensively or defensively? What, what offensively. 
offensively. Okay. Well, I think they're, I think they're difficult to guard, particularly anything that we can get the ball handler going downhill, we feel like is, is advantage. Again, what are we trying to do? We're trying to get to the rim, get layups, get fouled or shoot or kick out threes. Ideally, you know, that creates the advantage. I think biggest thing is in a dribble handoff is it has to have, uh, I'll use the word pace force. It's got to have uphill. Doesn't matter. It's got to be hitting because the, the speed, the force, the cutters, it creates confusion. It creates advantage. So the other thing is let's dribble at the low side of the defender where it's going to be difficult for him where we're making him go downhill. All right. So if I dribble uphill, I want to go at the backside of the defensive player. Any dribble handoff has to go at a defender. I'm not trying to take a dribble handoff to an offensive player. I'm going at the defender, particularly uphill. It's, it's going to be tougher for him to get it. Now, as I make my play, a lot of it too, as I'm coming, I'm really working on these exchanges. Can't really be a handoff. He can't handle it. It's going to be difficult to take it out of my hands and get the ball on the ground with pressure. So I'm going to drive it uphill at the defender at his low side and seal him. Pop your feet, stop, don't keep moving. It's going to be an illegal screen. And, I, and we see that. We see that a lot. So a text winner term, pop your feet. Take it to the point of contact, pop your feet and hold. Now, if you force a switch or in the NBA in that situation would be a late peel where we're going to peel, which is a late switch, I have that guy on my back now. I brought it uphill on, on the dribble handoff. I pitch it. He takes it. I've sealed. My man now is guarding a downhill drive. I'm rolling with the guard on my back, creating advantage. So now he's got a layup. I've got a layup. He hits me, layup. Somebody's in front. Then I'm looking to spray out opposite. Again, great way to break that down in a three-on-O concept type drill. Perfect. We're getting a lot of requests for drills to teach drive and kick, as well as the drills that you used to, to teach and it kind of emphasize the two count. Okay, perfect. Okay, that's that's where we were going. So that that's good. Okay. Um, here, I, I want to show you this because I actually got this from somebody else a couple of years ago when we were playing. People were switching these pick and rolls, you know, and, you know, the, the, the balance of when you're playing against these drags. You know, offensive package coming down the floor on a missed shot. The reality is you're seeing, you know, this, whatever the angle would be. I'm trying to get to the low side of that defender, right? And he's playing with force, going to get him in that screen. But even so, coming off of that, we're seeing a lot of switches. So as we went through it, you know, we would get bogged down at times. Maybe we had the advantage. Um, a couple of years ago in the in the G League, I had Luke Cornett um, that had played at Vanderbilt, seven foot shooter that's now with the Bulls and and Isaiah Hicks. I had that tandem of two actual big guys, so we were playing off of those guys. But you know, we found ourselves trying to take advantage of that mismatch, and it bogged us down a little bit. And they just helped, and it kind of took us away from what we were doing. So we started doing this. We did this two on O drill every day. And I would line the guards up. This would be a line of guards. And this would be a line of, of forwards or bigs. You know, we just call the guys forwards. So the, the drill is these guys have a ball and it's two on O, but we would add some coaches out here for, you know, for this guy. I would have a, a coach kind of soft here, but I would push that thing ahead, make the coach guard. And then he's working on coming in, screening the low side of the coach. And now he's coming off here. He's got the coach on his back. He rolls off, coaches out, and he's working on throwing pocket passes. You throw these pocket point guards, guards, they're going to be involved in these. They have to be able to throw these pocket passes. So this was our drill. So it taught the pace, the force, two guys working together, okay? And he's coming up, so he's defended. He's coming in with a purpose and we teach, you know, like all the NBA teams, when that guy's coming into screen, he's got his arms. I don't know if you can see me, but he's got his arms in. They're not extended, they're in. And he's, he's touching those hips of that defender and kind of popping him back a little bit. And then he's rolling out of there. 
I don't know if you can get away with it at the NBA. I mean, they'll knock the hell out of those guys sometimes with their hands and, and there's, you know, and they're able to get away with that. So, um, but the key again is you can't extend your arms out, but that's a drill we do every day. Now, we go right side, we go left side, and we're throwing pocket passes. We make every guard go through the lineup, throw pocket passes. We make every forward work on setting his angle at the right screen. Some guys are threes, but they might play four in a late game. We throw them in that line at, at times as well to make sure they can do it. But here was the piece that has helped us the most. Same drill. So once we've gone through and he's thrown the pocket pass twice, we go to the other side, we throw the pocket pass with our left hand twice. Now it's a switch. So as he's bringing it with force, and again, I've got my coach in here. I got the wrong angle. He's, we don't want him going to the corner. We want that ball coming where it's a threat and has force. Now it's a switch. He knows it's a switch. As he's coming under now, he is getting underneath that defender, if you can see that. As an offensive ball handler, I'm setting this thing up. As soon as he gets below the defender, he's turning and running. We call that our run roll. He's going to run roll out of that. And again, I got that from somebody else, and it's been very effective. He drives it immediately. We've got another guy down here, and we're throwing the lob to him now. So we've incorporated for us in, in these drag situations, we're in 20 to 30 of these every game on average. So now we are working on a big piece of what we're doing with the screen, the detail of it, the pocket passes, but now against the switch, we would get in the middle of game sometimes and say, hey, let's run roll, just run roll, run right. And those guys knew exactly what it was. We're looking at the lob, he's bringing it with force and we're throwing that ball up. We do that with both sides. We do that drill every day, every day. With our guards in breakdown, we, we, the most basic way, coach is right there. He's got a ball and, and put these guys anywhere you want to put them. Put, I'm just going to put one and two. Put them like that. Coach throws the ball on a bounce. He comes over and gets it. He has to get where he can see him with the ball. Ball's driven this way, he's got a slide, catch shot. If, if where we did before, where we threw the ball out to this guy and he had the lift so the ball can see him, we have floor balance and we're spaced. Let's say he goes that way. He's got to pull behind, he's going to pull back. We want that offense to be able to take two hard dribbles and then whatever it is, is it a hook pass? Is it, you know, wh whatever, pass you're going to emphasize that's what it is and we get a shot that's our that's just basic two man two man spacing drill balls being dribbled at you you got a slide space balls being dribbled away you pull to the ball very basic ball can see you working on split and vision making sure passes are coming in we're getting shots that we feel like we're going to get during the game okay let's let's keep building up let's go three let's add three guys now in training camp, this has been a staple of what we would do every day. Let's do it with the defense. Just, just we're running out of time. I want to share it with you. Coach, take the ball out of bounds right there. Okay, that's a C. If you guys can't see, it's not very good. Put three defenders in here. They have to be both feet inside the paint. And now let's take three offensive players outside the three-point line, okay? The coach now is going to throw the ball to anybody. So let's say he throws it here. Well, they have to get matched. We're in a drive and kick game. We're trying to drive gaps right now. We're trying to drive gaps. We're trying to touch the paint and we're going to drive and kick till we get a shot. Let's say we, we can do it. We did this as a breakdown. So we might be having action going at three different baskets, but we're working on this three on three long closeout driving kick and trying to get into our situations now where it's driving kick. Okay. Gonna, gonna add, um, I know we're running out of time. Let me show you a couple, couple more things. This drill we've done every day for the last three years, every single day we line up 
point guards are in this line, a big, or they're in this line. And now we've got a guard line and a wing line. So you just split your team, put them in, in these positions. This is our four on O driving kick, okay? We start it just like we would in a game. He's coming this way hard. We tell him, we want you coming out of these corners. He's coming in out of these corners. He's gonna take it. We're going right off the handoff into a dribble pitch, okay? As he does that, the point guard who gave it up goes down here. So we're in a four out right now, which again, we find ourselves in. I'm gonna change the, so you can see what we're doing. So now the four came off and gave it to the two. He's spaced the ball, the one went down. So we've got the three. So we're in a four out alignment. They have to touch the paint with the ball three times and make a three at the end of it. The drill's not over until we've made, start your number, three threes, four threes, five threes. So as he comes off that handoff now, he's driving it, he's got a space, ball comes out, he keeps going, he drives it. We have to re-space, rebalance, and touch the paint again. You can manipulate the drill saying, uh, you know, you gotta get three, three dribble handoffs and three paint touches. But the whole thing is the force with the dribble coming off of it. But again, and, and it would say, okay, guys, we're going to do this drill till we make three threes. Well, if we do it three times and make three threes, we're moving on to the next thing. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer. Um, one last thing. Have I got a minute here to I'll give you? I'll give you a minute, coach. We got a minute. All right. Here's, here's something I really like. And, and I saw this in the preseason. Let's say um, they're in teams. I've got team A, there's four of them, okay? Team B's on defense, okay? Team C is waiting down here. It's a cutthroat full court game. This is a preseason. We would put 14 seconds on a shot clock and, and there are no ball screens. There are no screens at all. This is a drive and kick game. So we put 14 on the clock. The reason we play it in the cutthroat you drive, kick, drive, kick, it's going to wear them out. So we play offense. A has the ball, drive, kick, drive, kick, trying to get a shot. Make or miss. Bs, take the ball out. You're going this way against Cs on defense. Make or miss, they get the ball. They're coming right into a drive and kick, just like I showed you the four on O drill with the handoff. They're going right into a drive and kick game. No ball screens, no post ups, no come togethers. They have to drive and kick the ball. So we do this and we would keep score. First team to three baskets. And then C, C plays defense, then they go to offense. So it's, it's really effective. And it's how we used to start the preseason to really you know, commit to the drive and kick, the spacing, all the things that come out of it. And it's, it's uh, really a good way to teach it and get the reps. Coach, this has been some great information. I've really enjoyed this session and got a, a good page of notes here uh, from this. Uh, just thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to join us and be a part of this. Well, I enjoyed it. I, I hope uh, everybody you know, was able to take something away or stimulate some thought. Uh, that would be great. Everybody stay safe and uh, be well. Thank you. We'll go ahead and end the session, get ready for Coach Morrison next.